Hi, this is Kristen, and I am doing a Uber Cares Spotlight on the superintendent evaluation process at the Dollar Bay Tamarack City School District. So I'm just have just gotten my first draft together. So we'll see how this goes and how the distribution goes. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about the process and um, why I've put this together. So if you just give me a moment, I'm gonna do a screen share. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen here and I'm going to make it bigger. All right, so this is my presentation. It's called the UPRCARE Spotlight Dollar Bay Tamarack City Superintendent's Evaluation. And it's going to ask the question, is the current evaluation process that is going on at the school district rigorous, transparent, and fair? And those words will be even more relevant in a moment when we look at the Michigan law, which requires this. That was just enacted in 2015. So the history of this talk is that I inquired in December after seeing some meeting minutes that mention an employee's periodic evaluation. And I made an inquiry to find out a status of that. So that inquiry led to this further investigation after I did not hear anything from the school district. The inquiry was made on December 20th and it's now March 20th. So in three months, it caused me to ask the question, why might I not be hearing about this? And what can I answer on my own? So I have found some answers that I want to share for anyone who is interested in the school district and might be also following this process. So uh, I have an inquiry of why hasn't the school board responded to basic questions about the superintendent's 2020 evaluation. I asked very basic questions. You can see it if, if there's enough um, <clears throat> pixels here that I requested to find out whether Superintendent Norland's evaluation was completed in the closed portion of the November meeting and or when her evaluation will be in completed, including the rating given to her. So that was uh, an inquiry that was made to the school district, to all the school board members, and no response has been received from the school board members despite repeated uh, bringing it up at public meetings and email follow-up. So the next question is, is should citizens be included on the evaluation process? What our what are our rights and opportunities? And in my exploration on this topic, I found some interesting information on how the school district is supposed to be doing their evaluations according to the information that they have posted on their website. So there should be more transparency into the superintendent evaluation and I'll show you exactly what that should look like. And I'll be showing you what is currently happening. Next question is, are the school district's uh, 2018 through 2021 evaluation actions meeting the requirements of the Michigan Act number 173 that passed in 2015 or was enacted in 2015 and the Open Meetings Act? And then what's next? So I'll conclude this talk with what's next, what are next steps for um, the school board members and is interested citizens. And I always like to highlight clearly what citizens should be looking for from our elected officials. And then what can we be doing? What are the actions that we can take if we are interested in following our school district, including this topic? And on the bottom you here, you could see, sorry, on the bottom is uh, pictures of our school board members. The school board president, Donna Ingman is in the middle and then uh, everyone else is on her side. And then on the right is our superintendent principal, Christina Norland. So that adds a visual component to this discussion. Okay, so the first slide, now the, oops. 
this slide may look a little bit boring because it's got the legalese of what does the law require. And we're just gonna cover a little bit here, but it's enough that it, it gives us a basis for understanding what the school district needs to do in order to meet the law and what the law is looking for. So I'm gonna read the highlighted portions. Uh, the top portion is from the Act Number 173 Public Acts of 2015. And the key section at the top on uh, 1249 that relates to us would be the school administrators and the board of a school district shall adopt and implement for all teachers and school administrators a rigorous, transparent and fair performance evaluation system that does all of the following. So you can put this recording on pause at any time to read more of this. Um, but I really wanna highlight just a few key elements here that tell us what we're looking for. And so the state of Michigan is requiring that school districts adopt and implement a rigorous, transparent and fair performance evaluation system. In this next section of C that's highlighted, I have highlighted uh, for the purposes of conducting annual evaluations under the performance evaluation system, the school district shall adopt, shall develop or adopt and implement an evaluation tool for school administrators. The portion of a school administrator's annual evaluation that is not based on student growth shall be based primarily on the school administrator's performance as measured by this evaluation tool. So the tool is very important and it is very detailed. There's a lot of information in the school tool, chosen tool that is uh, recommended by the Michigan Association of School Boards. And we'll do a scroll through that so that you can see some of the detail. We're not going to answer th that, but I want the public to really understand that there is a comprehensive process in place. Uh, while we are going to have questions about what's happening and what that looks like, uh, we want to know that we want to confirm that as a basis. And then the next section under the Michigan Open Meetings Act states that all deliberations of a public body constituting a quorum of its members must take place at a meeting open to the public. And we're going to see uh, specifically how that relates to the role of the school administrator. It says all deliberations of a public body constituting a quorum for anyone who doesn't know a quorum of our seven member board would consist of four members. So anytime four members are together, that could be considered a deliberation of a public body. Okay, so the Next section is where we're going to get into the Dollar Bay uh, School and how they have documented their evaluation process. So I just want to make sure I didn't miss any slides. Nope. Okay, so now we're in number three. And this slide is helping us to understand how any process at all was documented. I would introduce this by saying that there have been no public discussions of the planning process or the tool that was uh, that's being utilized. There have been no public discussions. There are some small references and we're going to cover those so that everyone can see at least what has been referenced in the meeting minutes. So first of all, Every discussion that has occurred has always occurred in a closed meeting. So the public has not been privy to any discussion regarding the school administrator's evaluation. So that's the first thing that we want to note. And the uh, next thing that we'll note is that the discussions that did occur in the closed session, these are references relating to those closed discussions. So uh, in no, on November 18th of 2019, those meeting minutes show on the top that the, there was a recommendation to go into the closed session to consider the periodic personnel evaluation of the superintendent as requested by the superintendent. So this reference actually is compliant to a certain extent, uh, meaning that there is a portion that can be discussed in closed session as if requested by the superintendent. So at the, is documenting that it was requested by the superintendent. 
this is the only time in two, wait, in 2019, I think we have two references. So this is all covering 2019. So this is on the right, you can see, I tried to give us some orientation to where the items were discussed. So first top item, November, 2019 school board meeting. And the bottom item are the December, 2019 um, board meeting. And from the meeting agenda, versus the minutes. Okay, so now it's coming back to me. So the top is referencing some uh, a discussion that occurred in November. The bottom is referencing uh, items from December. So the December 16th, 2019 meeting agenda wrote that there was a recommendation to adopt the completed year end evaluation for the superintendent with an effective rating. So that was what was on the agenda. Now, when we get to the meeting minutes, which is where the completed actions are documented, that's what's underneath. So the meeting minutes, which were approved in January state the following. There was a recommendation to adopt the completed year end evaluation of the superintendent. Now, if you notice, this doesn't actually tell the reader what score was adopted. It just said that it was to adopt the completed year-end evaluation. Now a reader might assume that the superintendent was provided with an effective rating and the reader could be wrong. There could have been a different rating that was actually decided. These are the only disclosures regarding the 2019 evaluation. So I, we've got our records now for 2019. This is all we have. I'll go through the notes. A closed session was held in October, 2019. October, 2019, similar to November, 2019. Durations for the closed sessions were not disclosed. Note two, the December 15th, 2019 meeting minutes were silent on whether the proposed effective rating was adopted or not. The meeting minutes do not disclose anything other than that the year end evaluation was adopted. The entire evaluation process was discussed during the closed session, including what or if a final rating was determined and what that rating was. So if it was adopted, I do believe that a rating had to be determined to comply with the law, but that rating was not clearly disclosed. And as you can see, you have to actually patch two different documents together in order to see this item and what was shared publicly. And the third item is that the school board October 2018 minutes record a 77 minute closed session with a part two 74 minute closed session in November of 2018. No 2018 board superintendent evaluation decisions were disclosed in the public records and no closed meeting start or end time was included in 2019 or 2020. So we're just noticing what was recorded and what was not recorded in each of the records, in the records for each of the years that we're discussing. Now 2020. So in 2020, there's only one reference that occurred in the November 15th minutes. This time it disclosed an employee's periodic evaluation. So in, these, in this record, it does not even disclose whether or not it is, it is the superintendent's periodic evaluation. So I would like anyone watching to appreciate the lessening of transparency that occurred from as we go along. So in 2018, we have times. In 2019, we have no times, but we do have that it's the superintendent's evaluation and that she requested it to be in closed session. And in 2020, we have nothing. We have no reference of whose it is. We have no reference that there was a request by the superintendent for it to be completed in closed session, and we have no timing on it. And as you can see that the motion was universally carried to go into the closed session, and based on attendance at the meeting, despite the fact that it's not in the records, because public citizens have been attending the meetings, I can share that the closed portion of this meeting was almost two hours in duration. 
So the closed portion of the meeting was almost two hours in duration. And when the board came back at the end of that time, when they entered the room and closed the meeting, there was no vote and there was no additional discussion on anything that took place in the closed meeting. And as we'll see in a moment, that, that does not look right. So we'll have, but we'll first looking at what we've got and then we'll get into what should have been happening. So I did do a follow-up with Christina Norland uh, requesting the clarification on the identity of the employee. And we had the following exchange on November 20th. So I asked the question regarding the meeting agenda, the agenda states that one of the two reasons for the two hour closed session was to review an employee evaluation. And then I asked if it was her and then why the name of the employee was not disclosed as it was the year before. She wrote back, the employee evaluation was mine, yes. And the underlining was uh, added by me, emphasis added. She wrote, there was no special reason for writing employee rather than superintendent. This was simply the way the lawyer with whom I was discussing a related topic said it. So I typed what he said in that moment. I believe he used that wording because it closely matches OMA wording. OMA is the Open Meetings Act wording. So the lawyer reference kind of, it confuses me as to why a lawyer's weighing in on how she refers to her evaluation being documented in the meeting minutes. But if the lawyer is weighing in on this, I would note for the public reference that the lawyer is advising something that is less transparent than more transparent. So if the, if the lawyer advised it, however it was determined between the lawyer and Mrs. Norland, that was determined to be less transparent for the public's benefit. The next question I asked was, uh, since 15% of the superintendent's evaluation pertains to skills and community relations, has the school board requested community input into Christina Norland's 2020 evaluation? If so, what process has the school board utilized to request community input? And I would note here that there is a significant section regarding community input uh, for the superintendent's evaluation. It's the second section of her evaluation and we'll look at it. I'm gonna show the document itself, but I want to just emphasize here that a question was posed to the school district about whether or not they requested community input. Uh, Christine Norland's response was that the community portion of the evaluation is to rate how I interact with the community and represent our school district while doing so. Soliciting evaluative input is not standard or recommended practice. So that was her statement. And we'll see in a little bit when we actually go through the evaluation itself, whether or not that stands true. Um, there's some information that's contained within the evaluation tool itself that disagrees with Ms. Norlin's statement. Okay, so now we're going to get into the parts of the superintendent evaluation process that the public has access to. And you can see on the left that I'm referencing the Michigan Association of School Boards. They have a document on their website that has the frequently asked questions. And we wanna understand as a community, what parts of the evaluation process we are included in and that we have the opportunity to participate and witness. So here's what it says in the highlighted section. It says in short, when it comes to evaluations, a school board can only go into closed session to actually conduct the evaluation itself and only if the individual being evaluated requests such. Hence, and there's bullet points and I've highlighted three of them. A board cannot call for a closed session in order to set or otherwise discuss the criteria upon which an administrator will be evaluated. This includes an outline or discussion regarding the goals and objectives that may ultimately become part of the evaluation. So any of that discussion is not acceptable for the closed session of a school board meeting. A board cannot call for a closed session simply to confer with one another in private regarding a pending administrator evaluation. 
I'll read that again. A board cannot call for a closed session simply to confer with one another in private regarding a pending administrator evaluation. Now we have had nothing but closed sessions in Dollar Bay for our administrator evaluations. Next bullet point says a board cannot conduct or cannot conduct the evaluation of an administrator via closed session if that individual did not request such. So while the meeting minutes do not consistently indicate that it was requested by the superintendent, it's possible that it was the superintendent that requested it, but it was not disclosed in the meeting minutes and the association took the time to spell that out. On the red highlighting, I've written the Open Meetings Act alert. There are no public board discussions on the Dollar Bay Tamarack City Superintendent's evaluation with the question of why not. And you'll see more in a minute as we continue look, looking through what the evaluation process is supposed to look like. So a few facts. One of them is, is that the school board has conducted no public discussion for the evaluations for 2018. 19 or 20 and that comment is made based on citizen public attendance at monthly school board meetings so unless there were undisclosed meetings there was no public discussion regarding the superintendent's evaluations that any that citizens witnessed and i reiterated a school board can only go into closed session to actually conduct the evaluation itself so that's only a portion of the evaluation process and only if the individual being evaluated requests such fact while 2018 meeting minutes uh, recorded start and end times for the closed evaluations 2019 and 2020 minutes included no start times i've said that before but i included it on this slide as well and then a little about uh, Christina Norland's contract in particular, since we are talking about her evaluation, uh, this seems relevant for the community to appreciate. Uh, one fact is, is that her contract with Dollar Bay includes a 1% annual bonus for ratings of effective or highly effective. So uh, while Hancock, I inquired as to Hancock when I wasn't receiving any word back from Dollar Bay, the superintendent in Hancock informed me that they did not, that the governor Whitmer allowed the schools not to have a administrator evaluation for 2020. This piece of information makes it curious that on whether or not what happened, right? If I, if I was getting a, a performance um, bonus for my evaluation, I think I would be interested in completing that evaluation. And once again, no information from the school district. So anyone looking at this simply has to wonder along with me. And then the fact, another fact on the bottom, this is regarding Superintendent Norland's uh, salary package uh, that for reference, that despite Dollar Bay Tamarack City School District providing Ms. Norland's only administrator experience when she began in 2015 and she was hired as the school's principal and currently with a salary package of $154,828, Ms. Norland is the fourth highest paid administrator in Houghton County and the highest paid of the three districts that combine the superintendent principal positions into one position. And that's Chassel and Lake Linden. And I believe it's Lake Linden that has more students and Chassel has less, but Ms. Norland made significantly more than either of the other two superintendents. So this is a very well-paid position. Uh, the taxpayers and the school board have been very generous to Ms. Norland. And it does seem like we should be working through these transparency issues with the performance evaluation so that the public has full access to the portions of the evaluation that we are entitled to. Okay, so now what is Dollar Bay Tamarack City's evaluation tool for the superintendent's evaluation in order to comply with the Michigan Act number 173. So the top here is where I've placed the actual link that's on the school district's website. So that links us to the superintendent evaluation. Uh, it's on the school district's transparency section. There's a transparency uh, icon in the top right of the school district's webpage. If you click the transparency section and then you go down, you would see a link to this evaluation. Hyperlink. The above hyperlink brings to the, brings the user to the Michigan Association of School Boards website section called posting requirements, indicating that the school board has agreed to this particular evaluation process 
in order to comply with the Act uh, 173 Public Acts, which states that the school district shall develop or adopt and, and implement. So not just adopt, but implement an evaluation tool for school administrators. So they're indicating that they are going with the Michigan Association of School Boards evaluation tool. So next, in the next section, we have the evaluation process itself. And I have another slide that might show this a little bit more clearly, but this indicates the public process, the school district should be convening at the beginning of the year per the Michigan Association of School Boards evaluation tool. So over on the right, it says at the beginning of the year in which the evaluation is to occur, the Board of Education and Superintendent convene a meeting in public and agree upon the following items. So you see several items that we're going to be agreeing on, the evaluation instrument, the timeline, the key dates, performance goals, appropriate benchmarks and checkpoints, the artifacts to be used to evidence the superintendent's performance, the process for compiling the year-end evaluation, the process and individuals responsible for conducting the evaluation conference with the superintendent, the process and individuals responsible for establishing a performance improvement plan for the superintendent if one is needed, and lastly, the process and individuals responsible for sharing the evaluation results with the community. And as you have seen, we have not seen any evaluation results shared with the community. So we're very interested in where the breakdown is in this process occurring because we can find no records of this occurring at a public meeting in 2018, in 2019, in 2020 or 2021. So now we're at uh, March. We've just had the March school board meeting on Monday and this conversation was not, this topic was not discussed. So we've already completed the first quarter of 2021 and we have not had this discussion as a school board. And it, the question I have underneath is, is why is the public planning discussion not occurring in public if it is occurring? Because there haven't been any closed meetings occurring on um, this, quarter one either. So what's going on and is our, our school board members complying with this requirement of the evaluation tool that they have chosen to commence the superintendent's evaluation? So I thought found this very illuminating and informative about what we should be looking for and what the public should be looking for in terms of evaluating on Ms. Norland's performance. Okay, the next one is, <clears throat> is pulled from the evaluation itself. And I really like this one. It's kind of a lot on one slide. I hope that it's able to be read, but I will, I, I'm easily contactable if anyone wants me to email them a copy from the school's websites. Um, this is where it will lead them. It might be a little bit tricky to find because you have to go to the Michigan Association of School Boards and then there's a hyperlink in there that leads you to the actual evaluation. But I found this very interesting. This is on one page and it's in the superintendent evaluation itself. And the planning section at the top, it goes through the items that I just went through on the prior slide. So evaluation instrument that at the beginning of the year, they're supposed to convene a public planning meeting, uh, which did not happen, but I really liked this slide. It's right in the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, so it, would, it will, will be helpful once the school district starts utilizing the tool, uh, this evaluation tool and completing these items in a public meeting. Underneath it, it says the checkpoints. So the Board of Education Superintendent meet at key points in the evaluation year as follows. And it talks about informal, formal update, informal update, and formal evaluation. Those all occur approximately monthly. And then at the bottom, I have highlighted that the formal evaluation is adopted by the Board of Education. So if the evaluation occurred in January, there was no formal adoption. So the red alerts I have highlighted are that the school board has not conducted the open meeting evaluation sections during public meetings. The school board has not conducted a planning meeting at the beginning of the year where the tools are decided. 
the school board has no process for sharing the evaluation results with the community outside of what I showed you in the public records. And the school board has not responded to inquiries, direct inquiries regarding the status of Christina Norland's 2020 performance evaluation. So this leads to quite a lot of questions. You know, we have some excellent detail in what we should see happening. And then we have questions of where it's happening and why the public isn't being allowed to attend the parts of it that we should be having public access for and why so little is being revealed. This next slide is from page 21 in the amended 2019 superintendent evaluation instrument. And on the left, you see that we have this lined out. It's kind of a nice little visual on what should be happening in open phase, which is open meetings, and then what could happen in closed phase. And once again, that's only if that's requested by the employee. So as you can see, there's several items that are required to be completed in the open phase and not the closed phase. So here it says the consensus that involves a closed session um, and that closed session portion of it indicates the steps that the school board should be taking or could be taking if a closed session is requested by the superintendent in order to complete the evaluation. And I highlighted at section nine, which is the Board of Education comes out of the closed session and returns to an open meeting and does the following. The board president reads aloud, and this is something that we really need to understand to see what we should be expecting. Item 10, the board president reads aloud the consensus score rating identified for each performance indicator and the calculated domain scores. And we're gonna go through this in, in a moment to, to show you that there's several areas. The consensus score rating identified for each performance indicator and the calculated domain scores. Next bullet, the score rating for progress towards district-wide goals. Next bullet is the score and rating for student growth. And the last bullet is, and then the overall rating earned by the superintendent. And it says that it may occur at a subsequent meeting. Item 11 says that the board president calls for a vote to adopt the completed year end evaluation for the superintendent. This did not happen in, in December. So we're, we're just left hanging as to what occurred in that November closed session. Item 12 is the superintendent notes his or her comments on the, on the evaluation. 13 is the board president and superintendent sign the completed evaluation form. And then the last item is the board president works with the superintendent to coordinate a public statement about the superintendent's performance a public statement about the superintendent's performance. So we have yet to see that for any year. And I would highlight the response that I got from the Hancock superintendent that said his evaluation will be publicly posted once it is delivered to him. So I found that very interesting that he intends to fully disclose his evaluation. And then I've also kept highlighted the portion here that says the completed evaluation form reflects the Board of Education's assessment of the superintendent's performance and is subject to the Freedom of Information Act. So any individual can request to see the superintendent's uh, in performance evaluation. I have requested the superintendent's performance evaluation. I have just completed a request for that and have not yet heard back, but that was completed uh, last week. So it's still within the five days allowable. Unfortunately, the school district has uh, delayed, I think every request that's been made since August of 2019 and extended for 10 days. And then they've sometimes opted to Sometimes they've given information, sometimes they have not. Um, but regardless, there have been some struggles uh, with receiving FOIA information. We currently have a, a fee challenge and appeal dispute, however you want to phrase it, for a very um, expensive cost in order to look at COVID invoices. So I say that just because we're mentioning FOIA and that could be the subject of a future a future presentation here, but for now we're going to come back to the superintendent's evaluation and to let everyone know that it is subject to FOIA. Okay, possible evidence of performance from the superintendent's evaluation. This is an interesting part of the process. 
If you recall a few slides ago, I said that 15% of the superintendent's evaluation pertains to skills and community relations and has the board requested community input. And uh, Superintendent Norland's response was soliciting evaluative input is not standard or recommended practice. And I want to push back on that and say that contrary to uh, Superintendent Norland's statement, the superintendent evaluation does reference uh, feedback from a wide variety of stakeholders about performance as the superintendent. And so what the evaluation does is it lists many, many different types of indicators there. It's called evidence of performance. So uh, a few of these that I've highlighted that pertain to the community, uh, the one in the middle says record of solicitation of feedback. So clearly that is in her evaluation. And so hopefully um, Ms. Norland and the school board members familiarize themselves with the material that is in the evaluation because that was a legitimate question to ask about and would have been uh, something that she could have easily included or the board members could have included as a part of this evaluation. So we have possible evidence of performance, a community survey, customer satisfaction indices, and on the right, feedback from a wide variety of stakeholders about performance as the superintendent, formal and informal community partnership agreements and plans. And there are many uh, possible evidences to choose from. The superintendent is under no obligation to submit evidence on all of them uh, as indicated in the instructions. But I just wanna pull out a few that could have been referenced and where information could have been uh, re solicited from the community in order to strengthen her evaluation. Okay. Great, so I'm in, in screen share and this is the superintendent evaluation itself. So we're going through the evaluation and I'm just gonna do a quick scan of this, but I want people to see how um, much detail is included and that it, it really looks like a good tool to me uh, to utilize, but it's a 31 page tool. Not all of it is the evaluation itself. Some of this is the instructions that I had copied in the back, but you can see that section A has to do with governance and board relations. And there are specific criteria for each of those scores uh, that have been given in this section. This is weighted 20%. Then there's narrative comments. Section B is community relations. And as a side note, uh, UPRCARES has weighed in on the community relations section. And we provided our own scoring based on our interactions with Superintendent Norland. And so we are interested to find out how the board uh, scored this section. But I would just want you to see that there are several criteria, one, two, three, four, five, six criteria, and then artifacts that may serve as evidence of performance in this domain. Those are listed on the bottom. And uh, you can see there are several. Uh, I had pulled out into my evaluation some of the ones that I thought were helpful. And this is community relations, once again, a narrative, staff relations, so a whole page on staff relations uh, weighted at 15%. Staff relations continued and a narrative. Business and finance weighted at 20%. Narrative. Instructional leadership weighted at 30%. And continued. And then this is where it all combines together to determine the professional practice rating. So, and we, the public, are privy. This should have been read so that we knew what the scores were based on what I just shared in all of these sections and categories. And this has never been read aloud at a public meeting. So these are other components of the evaluation. So there is a certain portion of her evaluation, 40% here based on student growth and progress towards district-wide goals. And then another evaluation scoring to add that together. And now these last pages, so there's several pages here that provide instructions and guidance for filling this form out. So I just found these very helpful to um, 
go into. And that's where I did some of the uh, copy pasting that I did into the presentation. But anybody in the public can read, can go through and better understand this. And all the school board members should be familiarized with this process and evaluating on accordingly um, using all the guidance that's provided in this document. On um, the evidence, possible evidence of performance is vast. Um, there's 57 on this page, and then it goes all the way to 107. So the authors of this tool were very detailed in what they thought could be useful to help the help present the superintendent's uh, evidence of how they're doing in their performance. So once again, I'm just kind of flipping through um, some of these pages. There's training provided by the Michigan Association of School Boards on this evaluation tool. And that'll be in my last slide in a moment. Uh, and then these are the authors of the tool itself. But it's a, it's a useful read for anyone who wants to become more familiar with uh, how our local superintendent is being rated and what our school board members are expecting are expected to be rating her with. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop share for this. And I'm going to pause the recording while I get my, uh, my screen back. Okay, so now I believe I have shared the correct item and we're back to our page with those possible indicators. Thanks for your patience on this. And now I'm gonna to go to our one of our last slides. We still have just a couple more slides here with the suggestions, but this one has to do with um, board member training. And the question is, is do board members need training regarding the evaluation process tool? And if so, have they received it? And the Michigan Association of School Boards uh, says, what kind of training is the district responsible for? And the response is that naturally the district is responsible for providing training one to training to anyone who will be conducting any portion of the evaluation process. For those conduct conducting administrator evaluations, including school board members, as it relates to the superintendent evaluation. So this is clearly indicating that the school board members are expected to receive training on the evaluation tool. And that's an open question of have the school board members been trained in using the superintendent evaluation tool. Underneath that is an actual reference to the Michigan, of so, of a Michigan Association of School Boards online training where they recently offered on March 16th a training uh, for school board members so that they can, and others regarding the superintendent evaluation training. So I imagine that per most relevantly pertains to the school board members. I did submit that to the board members on March 12th, uh, showing that that was being offered because I was doing research uh, for my prior presentation and I did not hear back. No board member responded. There was recently a public comment that inquired about the specific training that school board members have received on any topic, not just this one. The citizens suggested that the school board members receive training. And I currently have received no word that there is any indication that any school board member has been trained regarding the superintendent evaluation tool. Now, I'm would very happy to be wrong about that and very happy to, I would be very happy to find out that they had all been uh, formally trained on the tool. So I'll leave that as an open question and it is referenced in my suggestions on my next slide, but I want to kind of let people know where we're at that the public is voicing uh, the concern about super about school board member training, the school board members are not providing uh, clear responses on whether or not they're being trained in particular regarding this tool and that we have currently have no indication of such. So I hope to be wrong about that and I look forward to hearing more. What should the community be looking for from our school board members? So we're the community, we're the ones who are funding the school district. Um, some have children in school. You know, what should, we're responsible for the school facilities. What should we be looking for from our school board members in regard to the superintendent's evaluation? And these are the points that I put together that I thought the citizens should be looking for at a minimum. Top one is that they should publicly commence the superintendent evaluation planning phase for 2021 in a public meeting. 
in a public meeting. This includes completing all the planning steps referenced in the district's evaluation tool. Again, I can't say that enough at a public meeting, not in these closed sessions that are the only references that we can find. Next bullet point is that I would like a clarification on Superintendent Principal Christina Norland's 2020 evaluation status, including a reason on the secrecy. So if the school board has concerns that the public is raising, you know, that, that we're confused about this, I would encourage the school board to really explain what's the reason for the secrecy on something that is supposed to be a public matter. As you can see from what I've shared in my presentation, this should be a very public matter, what's going on with the secrecy. Next bullet point is that, it, that citizens should be looking for the school members to correct any misunderstandings regarding the items discussed in this presentation. So in the event that this presentation is shared with them, uh, which it may be, I do these things in draft form and then decide uh, what to do next. But should a school board member see this, I would appreciate any misunderstandings um, being brought to my attention so that I can be corrected on this. I don't wanna be sharing incorrect information with the community. Next bullet point is to clarify the status of each member's board training specific to the school district's evaluation tool. I'm happy to learn about other training as well. I think that would be very helpful for people in the community to know that the school board members are growing in their roles, that they're learning and developing their roles, and that they're willing to take training on that. And the training can easily, easily be located on the Michigan Association of School Board site. Uh, there, I've found a couple of times that I've been there, I found very relevant information um, right on the site. The school board members could also put out a request to let, to encourage the public to let them know. If you want us to keep our eyes out for items, just let us know. But any training feedback would be helpful for, for the public to know that our school board members are taking their roles seriously in regard to training both on the evaluation tool and any other training that's offered. One of the very interesting ones that comes up, or not really interesting, but relevant is uh, most entities offer training on the Open Meetings Act. So I've noticed both with the Michigan Association of School Boards and the Michigan Township Association that they both have an emphasis on the Open Meetings Act. And my hope is, is that they're also training on the what happens outside of meetings, because another concern that comes up in Dollar Bay is that insufficient discussion and deliberation occurs at the public meeting and causes citizens to wonder where it's happening and why there's not enough deliberation that is occurring on items um, between meetings and some items never come up at all during public discussion. For example, the, the school ban never came up during public discussion. There's been several items, um, but some of them have been significant. And this next one is, is use this as an opportunity to align the various stakeholders of the school district and get on a better page. So rather than uh, taking this as criticism that the school board isn't getting it right, um, the, I'm sharing this in a way that I want everyone in the community to become better informed on what we should be looking for and working on in regard to and participating in the superintendent evaluation process. So if our board members aren't informed about the tool and aren't trained on the tool, I hope that will be addressed. But I do hope it's an opportunity for the board members, uh, for the superintendent, for the community to become more aware of what to be looking for. Because as community members, we don't always know. I mean, I, I didn't know uh, about this. I didn't know the extent of putting together the planning process that is required to be completed in order to comply with this tool, which complies with the Michigan law. So we're all learning in this process. And in that learning process, we should all be getting better. So I hope that this can be utilized as an opportunity for everyone to better understand this important process that happens in our community with a very significant position in our community. And my bottom point here is that citizens should be looking for transparency from the school district to comply with the Open Meetings Act and the Michigan uh, Act 173, which is the Evaluation Act, to ensure our school district provides a rigorous, transparent, and fair performance evaluation system. So I think it's great terminology, a rigorous, transparent, and fair performance evaluation system. 
And then my last slide has to do with the citizens. What can a citizen do? And I have listed seven constructive actions that community members can take uh, as a result of hearing this and in case they're inspired to wanna to get more involved. Number one is to share this presentation with other Dollar Bay Tamarack City School District electors, taxpayers, parents. The community needs to understand the school's lack of transparency on this important item of school administration that's currently happening. The community also needs to educate ourselves on what we should be looking for. If something's not going right and someone in the community is bringing it to everyone's attention, then it's an opportunity for the community to educate ourselves as to what we should be looking for. Number two is to write to youprecares at gmail.com and request to be on our email list. I send out periodic emails from this email address where I advise on local events specifically pertaining, I've been very focused on Dollar Bay. I cover the Dollar Bay School Board meeting, Osceola Township, the Board of Review for Osceola Township, uh, local events that occur that generally are in conjunction with the local governance so that citizens have more easy access to our local governance. Number three is you can request to join Youper Cares and Local Affairs Facebook group, which is focused on local issues in Dollar Bay. So I do postings uh, into this account. So it's a private Facebook group that people can join. I do ask that they're interested in following the governance of Dollar Bay. Uh, this type of group may not be a fit for everyone. It doesn't have all the basketball games listed and all of the local events. Uh, it does tend to focus on the local governance and citizen citizens becoming informed on what's going on. Number four is we can write to our elected Dollar Bay Tamarack City School Board members. Here are all their names and all their email addresses and citizens can reach out to them at any time. These are addresses that are pulled from the school's website. So they're not privately collected. They are posted on the school's website and these are our elected officials. So reach out to them and let them know your thoughts and concerns. So that's number four. Number five is to attend the monthly school board meeting, which occurs on the third Monday of the month at 6 p.m. And the information is listed on the school's website. It generally shows up a couple of days, sometimes more, but you know, before the meeting. But you could simply put on your calendar the third Monday at six o'clock. It generally does occur on that week. And then check the school's website. So you can do a search for Dollar Bay School. school I, do, I put in a search for Dollar Bay School Board, and then the website comes up that has pictures of our school board members. Number six is to consider running for one of the five school board seats up for election in 2022. So we have five seats that uh, will be elected and they are required to be electors in our district. So um, let's get involved. So anybody who considers this an opportunity to help with the local governance should consider it. We're obviously working with our current, as best we can with our current um, school board. Uh, we're having some challenges and yet we hope to work through them, whoever is elected on the school board, but there are five seats that are up for election. So if this presentation or anything grabs a person for getting involved in local governance, this is a great opportunity. And we have several seats that are coming up in 2022. And my last point is to remember that it's our community, it's our school, it's our opportunity to participate in our local governance. So however we participate, the more informed we are about these matters, the more we know what we should be looking for, and the more we may sign up for an opportunity to participate even more in how the school is run and in finding out what we can do to make sure that it's being run well and that we understand how it's being run. So once again, my name is Kristen. I, you can send feedback to me at youpercares at gmail.com. That's listed. And I hope this was helpful and informative about our local school superintendent evaluation process in Dollar Bay, Michigan. Thank you.